And welcome, Professor Rogers. It's wonderful to have you today. Thank you for joining us for Peacekeepers Live. Very pleased to be with you. I hope I can help a little this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, we are too. We are too. Thank you. So I want to kick into our first question because we only have so much time together today. As we know, you've dedicated your life to peace studies. Could you tell us some more about that journey to where you are today? It's a very odd journey. I started off originally as a biologist. I worked in tropical crop research in East Africa. I got very interested in the whole issue of conflict over resources. And when I came back to Britain, I lectured in environmental sciences and specialised in the relationship between peace, security and the environment. And I did that for eight years and then I joined Bradford University, which has its own peace studies department. It's not unusual in some ways in that peace research has come from all works of life, walks of life. I remember at one stage in Bradford, out of about 15 staff, we had uh, five scientists. The others were social scientists. So it's a very sort of cosmopolitan group and interdisciplinary. But that's how I joined it. So I was really interested in North-South relations, got intensely interested in environmental conflict. And that's where I worked on most of the last, what, 30 years, I'm afraid. It's, a, it's been a, a curious journey, an odd journey, but not that unusual for people who work in peace studies. Mm. And you've produced some wonderful work over your years. So it's wonderful to have you with us. Where are, where in your opinion are we as a global community in relation to living peacefully together as you've experienced? Well, one of the things to remember in, in a world which has so many problems ahead of it is that most people, most of the time, live in conditions of tolerable peace. peace. Now, that's not perfect by a long shot, but it isn't all war and disaster. But you asked me what the problems were. I think there are very, very quickly, there are probably three problems. Uh, one is in inevitably climate breakdown, the risk of climate collapse. And that is probably the most immediate worldwide problem. The second problem, I think, is marginalization. Far too many people are relatively marginalized. The world economy isn't working as it should. And so people are often getting desperate. And this has been made worse even by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then thirdly, I think we always tend to look at problems in terms of how to uh, sort of suppress problems rather than sort of get under them. It's kind of lidism. You keep the lid on things rather than going underneath the real problems and working what they are. So we tend to see things in terms of military solutions. And I was very struck by what Mark was just saying earlier on about the role of the UN, which is so important because intrinsically it's not trying to use force. It's trying to find every other means. And this, I think, is what we've got to learn. We've come a long way in many ways. We've been some terrible times, the risk of nuclear war. But at the moment, I think we have this joint problem of uh, essentially uh, climate breakdown and marginalization. If we can get to grips with that, then I think the future is pretty bright. But we haven't many, really too many years to do that in. So there is an urgency, I'm afraid, facing us. Mm. And with that urgency and what you've noticed, what has been the most inspiring and positive moment then you would say in relation to building lasting peace that you have witnessed during your career? I don't think I can say one moment, moment um, of doing it, but if you look in, in broad terms, we always tend to look on the dark side of things. And I'll give you one example. We tend to forget that nonviolent action, uh, trying to persuade people without the use of force, can work and often works very well. I'll give you several examples. I mean, if you go right back to the fight for suffrage, whether it's women's suffrage or other forms of suffrage over the last 120, 150 years, many of the changes came through public action, often nonviolent, not always, but often nonviolent. And that had a very big impact. And then you look at the extraordinary work of Gandhi and people like him in the 1930s, which really led into the move of many countries to get their own independence, uh, basically to be uh, off of what we would call then the colonial yoke. And that, of course, worked in the early post-war years. Although there was much violence, there were wars of liberation. In many cases, the relative move from sort of colonialism to post-colonialism was often done with really relatively little violence. And then two other more recent examples, very much in my lifetime, one would have to be the civil rights movement, particularly in the United States, uh, where it spread worldwide. Now, again, the attempts at nonviolence may have been met with force, but in sort of concert with other forms of action, uh, arguing repeatedly and people not being prepared to give way, 
we eventually got major changes in the United States and in other countries. It's an ongoing thing. And I suppose one other example we tend to forget is at the end of the Cold War period, when you had the transition to uh, different forms of rule, often more democratic rule in Eastern Europe, that was often achieved partly by public action, by public movements, not by violence. There wasn't much violence involved. So if you look at all of those uh, and take a more broad look, there are other ways of going forward. There are other ways of, of getting change. You don't have to have the resort to the military the whole time. And in some ways, I think that's one of the most important lessons that I've tried to learn in the years that I've been working in this field. And that's a really a great point. And that that's what you've focused on to try and learn. And I think that's an important piece for a lot of people to maybe learn. Could you talk about the importance of why studying peace is, you know, really important to yourself, but also for others to know as well? Well, the group that I've been involved with in Bradford for the best part of 40 years, the Peace Studies Department, it's Peace Studies and International Development, and that works worldwide to bring students from all over the world to study together. I was taking a class recently of about 80 students. We happened to be looking at the problems of political violence. I would reckon there were probably 20 different nationalities in that one classroom with huge experience. And I think it's a combination trying to learn how more peaceful approaches work but at the same time, trying to work out how uh, you could do it in a way in which you're using experience as well. A lot of our postgraduate students have come from very difficult areas. They come from conflict zones. Uh, they've really been up against it themselves. And they are also very experienced. They know how to try and bring people together. They know how to build peace after conflict. And working like that, they work together in a way in which they combine their practical knowledge with the theories that the academics work out. And if you can do that, I think you're really making a very big difference. The Bradford Group have probably trained the best part of 1,500 people over the last 40 years, many of whom are working in recent zones of conflict. Uh, and they're very practical, they're very well orientated, and they're not expecting miracles. It's a long, hard task. And building peace after conflict is very difficult. And it's what is, makes it so important to actually be able to prevent the conflict in the first place. But I think that's the kind of way that peace researchers work in peace education. And it can make a very big difference, certainly. Uh, thank you, that. And how can, how can individuals start to study peace in their own way as well, outside of just university studies and the programme that you have um, of peace studies at the University of Bradford? What other areas are there that people can get involved in and support your work and support their own work um, to learn about peace studies? Well, I, th I think there are two things to learn here. Uh, one is that if you're actually trying to do something for peace, and you may do it in many different ways. Uh, you, you may work sort of even locally with some sort of group that is trying to prevent violence. Uh, you may work in terms of campaigning or organization like Amnesty International. You may be working in international development to help people. Even at a practical level in your own locality, you can do a lot and learn a lot. And I think if you're able to do it, then it often feels daunting. You know, I'm one tiny person in the midst of all these global problems. But remember, one is never alone. Different people can do things in different ways. Uh, artists, musicians and the rest could all make a difference. And it's really recognizing that you're part of a whole. So that, in a sense, I think is the first thing. The second thing is always have hope that we're playing it long. And remember that one of the most useful definitions of prophecy, it's not the usual one one hears, is that prophecy is suggesting the possible. So always have an eye to what you think might be the way forward and discuss it with other people and learn what other people are doing. I think it's hugely important to be as knowledgeable as one can about these issues. And anybody can do that. You don't have to be sort of highfalutin professor or anything. You can do it in your own practical way. But the important thing is if we recognize we're all in this together, and support groups like the United Nations Associations and all the others, then I think we are making a difference to ourselves. It may get daunting at times, it may get depressing, but there is always a way forward. And overall, I think things are slowly, with setbacks, improving worldwide. I mean, my wife and I have seven grandchildren, and some of them could be alive in the next century. And what would be great is the kind of work that is done now by yourselves and others contributes to a more peaceful world, world, which is one of the things why I think this movement, the Peace One Day movement, is so valuable in its impact. 
couldn't agree more with that. Um, and I really appreciate you touching on that. And just as we as we close off this, I just one thing that you would say to a young person to inspire them, to keep them on their journey. And we just have 10 seconds. What's your one takeaway for, for a young person? Oh, the one thing is never get up, get, never give up hope. Hope is the great thing. Stick with that and you'll see it through. And remember, you're not alone. There are millions of people who think the same way worldwide. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Rogers. It was wonderful to have you. I'm going to pass back over to Jeremy in Studio A now. Thank you.